Thank you for joining today's nonprofit 911 to first time donors and to repeat donors with Tom Ahern and Jay Love. I'm Barbara Bradley, coordinator for the Network for Good Nonprofit Outreach team, and also your moderator for today's call. Joining me on the call is my colleague, Melissa Mundy, and we want to talk about some light housekeeping before we get started. All lines are muted, so we invite you to submit questions via the Q&A panel on the right side of your screen at any time. And be sure to send questions to all panelists so that we don't miss any. And lastly, everyone will receive a PDF copy of the slides and recording in your inbox within 24 hours. You can access this presentation and many others on nonprofit911.org. About the Network for Good. Network for Good is a nonprofit social enterprise that empowers nonprofits and corporate partners alike to unleash generosity and advance good causes. NFG helps nonprofits raise funds for their missions through simple, affordable, and effective online fundraising services. In addition, we offer free training through our online learning center, our interactive online community, and this very webinar series. Series. Much of our expertise comes from processing nearly a billion dollars in donations from more than 100,000 nonprofits since the 2001 founding by Internet pioneers, AL, Cisco, and Yahoo. This webinar is part of our free 911 training series designed to help nonprofit professionals excel in their online outreach. We host these webinars several times a month to feature some of the most brilliant minds in our sector. They, along with experts from complementary fields, present and help you succeed in winning hearts, minds, and donations. The latest schedule is available at nonprofit911.org. And now we need to introduce today's speakers, Tom Ahern and Jay Love. Tom Ahern of Ahern Donor Communications is considered one of the world's top authorities in the field. He specializes in applying the discoveries of psychology and neuroscience to the day-to-day -day business of inspiring and retaining donors. He is the author of four well-received books on the topic with two more in the pipeline. His recent, client, his recent clients for cases, direct mail, newsletters, and training include Catholic Relief Services, Save the Children, Princeton University, and many smaller and local nonprofits. Jay Love is CEO and co-founder of Boomerang and currently serves as the Senior Vice President of Avectra. To these positions, Jay has titles at Social Solution, Blackboard, eTapestry, and Master Software Corporation. He currently serves on the boards of numerous nonprofits and one private tech company. Because of his valued experience, Jay has given more than 2,000 speeches with the charity sector, winning his expertise around the world. Tom Jay, I'm so excited to have you both join us today and speak to our audience. Jay, I'm going to pass presenters' control to you, and the floor is now yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kara. And I'm going to actually uh, turn things over to Tom. The first uh, several slides of the presentation in the first 20 or 25 minutes or so. Return. So, Tom, take it away. Uh, Jay, and thank you very much, Kara. Uh, can you hear me okay? Good. All right. So, the, uh, the first question you're seeing on your screen is, um, is in answer to the title of the presentation, turning first-time uh, donors into repeat donors. So why would we bother doing that? Jay, give me the slide, please. Here is the bottom line, and it is a bottom line. It is a financial bottom line. Seventy percent, uh, and sometimes that number is even more grave, because I've seen as high as 80 percent, of first-time donors do not make a second gift. So you spend all this money bring them in to your organization, getting you know, getting that first date gift, and then they disappear within twelve months and you'll see them again. They've got their put their philanthropy in some into somebody else's organization and mission. So this is a you know, we this is the number. The question is, is this a really bad number or is it an okay number? And the the answer is it's a horrible number. Uh, that is that kind of results in the for-profit commercial world. If you were selling, for instance, I use Nike here. If you were in a product or service and you're in 70 percent of your first time, uh, buy customers never made another purchase from you. Basically, the company out of business and you're losing your job. So we the numbers cannot be sustained. This is this is a choke point on growth, and so nonprofits can't do more of their mission. It is 
is a, um, a an obvious uh, sign that something is not working properly in the relationship you have with your donors. And today, I the only thing I look at are the communications issues of the various clients who come to me. So today, uh, that's what I'm focusing on is communication. So let's look at the next slide, Jay. Here, lifetime value, LTV. Get uh, familiar with these um, very Roman-looking uh, because lifetime value is the single most important metric that we have in the nonprofit industry, and it's a it's a metric, in, incidentally, that comes from the for-profit world. And what it describes is the first class gifts. Every gift made by a new donor from that a new one to the very last one, which can be way down the road and could be, in fact, a charitable bequest. I had a client uh, a couple of months ago. We got a piece of mail back, and it said, you know, stamped on the outside from the post office, it said deceased. So we ran to the database to see who this was and discovered that it was a woman who had made her last gift at 101 and had been acquired actually when she was probably in her 50s. So you're looking at a lifetime of giving that's almost 50 years old, long and consider how much that adds up to. It's a lot of money. And yet most of the people you're bringing in who might go to 101, you're losing in the first year. So this is... This is a financial tragedy, if, if for other reason, because your your nonprofit needs this cash in order to do good. Let's the next. So, the good news is, and all, and actually, there's all only good news here today because these things are very easy to make improvements in. And if you do a relatively small improvement in your retention, your donor retention, and that, of course, is what the Bloomerang product is supposed to help you with and to prompt you to do the right things in the communication side, the, um, the 10 cent improvement that you might get will improve your revenue 50 cent immediately, immediately that year. And of course, if you're holding on to more of your donors, you're getting much more lifetime value, LTV, out of those people. It's just the beginning of a ramp up in your profitability. But here's the first thing. Show me the love. Your new organization, I, for some reason, enough to get my attention. For some reason, you've gotten my attention. For some reason, you've you, you're, you've matched values and my interest, and therefore, I have trusted you against all my natural instincts, incidentally, um, with that first gift. Uh, now, now what? What do you think? Well, let's look. You know, let's look at a very good example. Next slide, Jay. The I like stealing from the root best, the people that I know because I know their numbers and I know them personally. I know they're succeeding. Now this is uh, this is food for the poor. They're located headquartered down in uh, Florida, and they are a wonderful organization. They work in Central and South America. I mean, what it says there in the name of the organization, they're feeding people that otherwise are not getting enough food or missing meals basically on starvation. And it's a faith-based organization and that's always an advantage because there we know more or less what the values are that we're asking people to express through their gifts. And um, look at the cover. You know, this their donor newsletter and Angel Aloma, the executive director down there, have revamped all their communications and made them very, what is called, donor-centered. So you're going to see the word you, which is the big operative word in donor-centered communications, the you being donor. So why you matter. It's the entire cover of their donor newsletter. Go to the slide. Here's a 
question that you need to ask yourself. Are we treating in communications our donors as our organization's superheroes? The answer to that is, I don't know, then the real answer is, no, you're not. And if the answer is, well, a little bit, then the uh, the thing you can do is make little bit a lot, because the investment of uh, donor love would produce a, a uh, significant bump up in revenue. I, I can uh, one of the, uh, the people that uh, has adopted this advice and went out and tried this advice found that their gain went up 1,000 percent immediately. And that's a, you know that's what we're looking for is these kind of like, like you know, I, how can we get an astonishing new result rather than an, you know the same old, old mediocre result we've been getting. And the way you do this is by treating your donor as a superhero. Next slide, please, Jay. Charities talk in fashion. I call it donor negligent. Whatever it is uh, the general approach to reporting, let's say, in a donor newsletter or in a, a an appeal letter or on the website, for that matter. The charity says, we did this amazing thing. Oh, look at this amazing program. We did that, too. And, oh, by the way, if you happen to have sent in a gift, uh, thank you very much. You know, we'll put your name on a list. And uh, um, to use my sports analogy uh, coming out of me today, it means <laughs> that you're putting your donors up in the stands, watching the organization down on the field, playing the game. And, you know, and then the fans. Ends up in the stands, the donors are applauding with their checkbooks. But that's really not very involving. I want to be involved. I want to feel as if I am part of the charity. And of course, I should be made to feel as if I am part of it because I'm giving you my hard earned money and you're not giving me anything. So it's, uh, you know, it, 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 fundraising is a type of marketing, it's a type of sales. It, it's not different. And uh, but it is actually in one way, which is if I'm paying over my hard-earned cash to be building a product or service, I get something back from them. When over my hard-earned cash to a charity, what I normally get back from them is the negligent behavior. Let's look at the next slide, Jay. This is an example, and uh, you know I've been picking on this example for a number of years now, so I'm sure the Red Cross in uh, the UK uh, have nothing good to say about me if they're even aware <laughs> I exist. Uh, but this this is a moment in time, and um, it is so common to nonprofit reporting. It come came off their homepage. What had happened was there was a natural disaster in Pakistan. A lot of people living in the UK had emigra emigrated from Pakistan to that country, and now they're looking and hearing all bad news back in the homeland, and uh, they flood the Red Cross with money to help the people back home. Here's how the Red Cross in the UK reports on it. What we are doing in Pakistan. Read how we're helping survivors. I've schooled all the weeds because uh, that is indicative of what's called corporate communications, which is a type of public relations activity, and is the Typical behavior, particularly of brand name and bigger charities, they do it better than the smaller charities. They don't do it as well sometimes as the smaller charities. Let's look at the next slide, Jay. This is donor recognition, state of the art, as practiced by almost every charity I have ever encountered. And all this is a list of names. That's it. You know, there isn't much emotional gratification from putting my name in a list. And uh, there are some other subordinate issues, which is, of course, there is emotional atta emotion attached to a list. You spell my name wrong, I will hate you and never <laughs> give you a check again. And uh, also, if you really want to get under my skin personally, this is just me as a as a owner, and we give. To many, many causes, um, you know, 
break your list up by how much somebody gave, so that the people in the cheap seats can feel like they're in the, you know, they're, they're kind of skin flints. Um, next slide, Jay. This is what your donors think you, how you organization perceive them. All they are is a checking account attached to a life support system. And this is, we hear about donor fatigue, but I think that, first of all, I don't, I, I don't think the phenomenon is, uh, is exactly as it has anticipated. I don't think it's because donors are, you know, get sick of being asked for gifts from their favorite charities. What I do think it is, is they get sick of being treated like an ATM machine where, you know, you just go up, hit some buttons, and it slides out into your hand. So let's look at the solution for this. Now, we've looked at the problem. The solution is to move away from donor negligent writing and move toward donor centered writing. It's a very simple um, uh, modification because you're using the same information, you're inverting who gets the credit. So in the the don't negligent, you know, we did this great thing, and oh, by the way, if you send in a check, well, now we're saying we donor first, and that's important. I I think physically the donor gets the highest priority. With your help, all these amazing things that we talk about happened, and just as important, part two, without your help, they're not possible. So giving the donor all the credit, and uh, let's go to the next slide. What led mocking to ultimately? I write a lot of direct mail, and it's a direct mail is a brutal medium. You know, it's a gladiatorial contest. Very tiny response rates, and you know, it's easy to get no response, and so you really have to work hard. And uh, what I am doing now in my in my uh, acquisition direct mail, bringing in new donors, is I'm sure they understand that there is an important job that has to be done, and they're the only ones who can do it. And I'm very clear in my own head that what I care about when I'm acquiring these new donors is not their money. It is what I care about is their participation. Building my donor pyramid, I'm building out the base, and uh, I want to talk to them not about cash, but what about what they make possible? And I'll give. You, I want to show you some examples of this. Uh, next slide. This is nothing I wrote. I don't want to take credit for somebody else's work. This is wonderful work that uh, came out of Dublin, and it's for Barnardos, which is a uh, uh, a well-known charity uh, in the United Kingdom and in Ireland. It's been around since the 1800s. So it deals with kids, troubled kids, orphans, stuff like that, families. And here's a direct mail acquisition pack from Barnardo's. And kids like Jenny, and look at Jenny, she's, she got that, um, she's got the appropriate face for a direct mail charity dealing with children, which is a troubled face. The, uh, the smart face does not raise uh, as much money. In fact, the, the frowny face raises 50% uh, more in tests than the smiley face. So you want frowning faces going in, and you want to say kids like Jenny need heroes like you. That very simple seeming statement is uh, is, per, is actually a masterpiece of copywriting for direct mail in charity work. Because common language, words kids, you got other common language. They need heroes, and so they're giving you your your self appreciation. Who am I? I am a hero to a child like this because I am willing to to trust my hard earned money to this good. Cause. Let's look at the next one, Jay. This um, back to uh, for the poor, and this is the uh, inside um, spread, the uh, centerfold for their donor newsletter. And you're seeing, you know, it's so in real life, it's two eight and a half by eleven pages. Very, you know, nice big spread. And look at it; there lies right in the headline, in the big type. And that's where you have to have these 
messages in the big type. If you're putting your donor love into the body copy, it will not work because most people never, ever read the articles. But they will read the big type. That's what we know from eye motion studies. Their lives depend on you, the big type says. Without you, innocent lives are lost, says the big type. You know, and local hospitals cannot save critically malnourished children in Guatemala. They look to Sister Rosa and Sister uh, Rosa, excuse me, and Sister Rosa looks to you. So it, basically, this page demonstrates um, first-rate donor love, first-rate uh, donor centricity. It also demonstrates what you should be doing, uh, not instead of what you probably are doing. The the weird thing about donor newsletters, I'll just say in passing, is that they are not actually about the organization. They're actually, when they work and they produce a ton of revenue, they're actually about the charity. I mean, the uh, donor. Go to the next one. I'll just wrap this up because actually we need to move along pretty fast. Here's Planned Parenthood in Minnesota. This is their annual report. This is the cover of their annual report. And right away, and this is because they are they have drunk the Kool-Aid there, um, open, thank you, and there has never been a tougher year for Planned Parenthood than there is right now with all of the, you know, people lining up hoping to defund them. Slide, example, smile train, well-known cause, so everybody's familiar with it. But look at this email that came in. Uh, this child from Vietnam received free fee, and then important surgery thanks to supporters like you and there's the, there's the wonderful before and after photo just you know it's tight it's fast it gets message across i feel good and that's really what your job is is to give me the joy of being uh, a donor next slide and this is the next and last major section of my portion um this, well, how much of this do you do? Well, you want a lot. You want to stay in very close touch. Um, let me show you how, for instance, CARE, next slide, uh, is there stay in touch. So the, Lisa Sargent, she, she did a wonderful thing for the rest of us. She's kind of the, the, the thank you guru in the nonprofit world. And she sent a, uh, a first-time gift into CARE. She wanted to see. She wanted to see how they would respond or how they acted after that. And you can see here this list, which she dictated. You know, there's something coming in three weeks after. There's something coming in four weeks after. Seven weeks, eight weeks, nine weeks, ten weeks. It's every week thing is coming in from care, and it's not always an appeal. That's me. Um, sometimes you know it's reporting, it's other things and other offers and so forth. Um, next slide, just to give you a sense of you're pretty under communicating with your your uh, your donors. And here's a uh, an online retailer in seven months, like a, an Amazon or somebody like that, will send 125 emails. So you know you're not you're probably nowhere near what you could be doing in terms of staying in touch with people. Go to the next slide. Remember, this is very important. You're not in their pockets. You're trying to involve them in something because it's the way the donor looks at it. Actually, the cash aspect of it is the least interesting part of a gift to the donor. Want to get involved with something? Turn next slide, please, Jay. And they do not want to be treated like a cash cow. So <laughs> you've got, to, yeah, it's a pretty nice cow too. Um, and let's go to the next slide. Uh, we've got, you know, this is your checklist. Here. This is from the agitator. And if anybody knows what in the world they're talking about in the fundraising uh, universe, it is uh, it's the guys, Rod Traver, Tom Belford. At the uh, agitator, these guys are the top of the pyramid, and they know they have been hugely successful in all their nonprofit endeavors, and they know what works. And these are the seven pieces of advice they give. So let's now, you know, kind of take it out. We're going to do the last little section for me. Next slide. All donor communications 
um, is this little virtuous circle. There's not that much activity. You ask me if I help, then you thank me for my help, then you pour it to me what you did with my help. So, you know, you've got these three items. You've got appeals, you've got thank yous, you've got newsletters. The newsletters are your reporting mechanism. And that is a cycle, and it never quits. And it doesn't matter how you acquired the donor. It will do them. You have to have a reporting mechanism, which is often, you know, I look at what how what you're good at, then be terrific at asking, they can usually be, you know, acceptable at thanking, but where they really don't come up to the mark is in the reporting. So let's look uh, at the next, because there is a little variation here. Also, you want to remember this. This is neuroscience, and I'll show you that neuroscience just in a second. When you ask me, you want to flatter me. When you thank me, you want to flatter me. And when you report to me, you want to flatter me. So all your thank yous are these kind of robotic, thank you, got your gift, your gift is now recorded, here's your bill that will put in front of your accountant. You want to get into more uh, role language. You don't want your computer doing your donor relations program. Um, let's look at the next slide. This is the neuroscience behind that flattery. See, it turns out, it, somehow, I have no idea why this word, you know, was important, to evolution, but it turns out our brain cannot distinguish between sincere flattery or insincere flattery. All flattery is good. So in other words, you cannot make a mistake. You cannot over-flatter me as a donor. And it is that you would do it in sincere flattery anyway, because anybody that gives you money and they don't expect anything back from that um, is really doing you a huge favor. So if you don't feel gratitude, well, maybe you're in the wrong industry. Um, finally, let's look at, because there is some pushback on this. You know, we all grew up on, well, flattery is like, I don't know, number eight of the uh, seven original sins or something. You know, it's bad. got a bad rap. Don't do it. You know, you get Edmund Burke, and yeah, kind of with a wig, saying flattery corrupts both the receiver and the giver. But, next slide. Norman Burke was in the 1700s or something. You know, we don't have <laughs> neuroscience. We don't have to listen to this guy's opinion. Is rubbish. That's it for me, Jake. And, and uh, Tom's got a little bit of thing about his newsletter. I will mention something here. Uh, Tom's newsletter is one of those that you welcome in your inbox every single week that it comes. Always has good information, and I and I urge you all to take a look at it and see uh, if that's so. We alluded to this, and for any of you that came late, I'm going to uh, uh, go over a little bit of some of the same statistics just as a, a slight repeat, but why is it so important to retain first-time donors? When we had that question, well, I, I was a statistical and math major in college, and so I, I do a lot of things with math behind the scenes here. So it's amazing Tom and I get along as well as we do because I, I'm sure he's much more of the other side of the brain than I am on many of those things. But uh, I love to look at this particular slide because it lets you know, keep in mind we're pointing to the attrition rate, which is the second column there. If you start with a 1,000 donors and you have an attrition rate of 20%, you can see after five years you diminish down to 328 donors. But start with a thousand donors, and you have an attrition rate of 60%, which is still a little bit better attrition rate than most first-time donors fall into. You go from a thousand down to just 10 in five years. That's sort of scary because as we dig into the actual data from nonprofits, uh, this was the data from the. Uh, the Association of Fundraising Professionals and the Urban Institute, they, when they look at the retention here, we can see that the new donor retention, and this was taken from the data from hundreds and thousands of donor databases in some reform, the donor retention was 27%. Look what happens if you can turn those individuals over here on the right-hand side 
the upper right-hand corner there, if they become a repeat donor just the second time or the second-year donor, the retention rate on the average is 70%. It's a more double the difference there for you and makes such a huge difference if we can move people from that first time to the second time for that. And as I mentioned, the study is and you worked here that nearly seven out of every ten donors from the previous year did not donate at all the next year, and that's where we can we can apply this information and 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 uh, both to refer to a mutual friend, Dr. Adrian Sargent, who works with us here at Morang quite a bit, uh, and talking about just a small improvement overall of 10% in your overall retention can double the lifetime value of the database. And Tom spent some really good time talking about the lifetime value and what it can mean to your organization. If you ever want a very good, involved, and strategic board meeting, put the monthly reports away and discuss the concept of lifetime value with your board members. I'm going to bet that the majority of your board members, just like myself, who serves on seven different nonprofit boards, were not aware of what the average lifespan of a donor in our database was and what even the average gift was. Most people far underestimate both of those two numbers, thinking that, you know, that we've got people that stay with us for 20 or 30 or 40 years and that their average gift is $500 or $1,000. And that's usually far from the case for almost every nonprofit going. And when I talked to Dr. Sargent and he talked about this lifetime value, I said, can you prove this to me uh, with a, a spreadsheet or something, Dr. Sargent? And this is what he did for me. We took a look at a database here of 5,000 donors with an average gift of $200. And we talked about a retention rate of 441% moving to 51%. And you can see just what a difference even the first year makes. Instead of $451,000, you raise $561,000. So it was a difference of $110,000. And there's another $100,000 difference in the next year. You also notice that people stay with you, in some cases, for four additional years. So have a difference here of $820,000 raised from these same donors versus $1.3 million almost on the right-hand side. And don't forget, this is not counting the stewardship. That's where the extra bump comes from. The people that have been with you three, four, and five years or longer are the most likely ones to bring in additional donors. They're the most likely ones to be stewards for your organization. And that's where the doubling of the time value can come into play. Now, for those of you that do not know how to calculate your retention rate, and I know this is often the case. I, I was just in a room full of fundraising uh, officers in Chicago a couple of weeks ago. I had about 150 people in the room. I asked them what the retention rate was for their database. Out of that 150 people, only three folks raised their hands and said that they knew what the retention rate was at that point in time. It's very simply taking the number of donors in the current 12 months and dividing it by the number of donors in the previous 12 months from the same pool. So let's get an easy mathematical example. You had 1,000 donors in 2011. Of those 1,000 donors, 450 of them gave again in 2012. That would give you a retention rate of 45%, which meant that 55% were in your attrition rate that fitted in and moved out. This is one of the things that we measure very closely with our Bloomerang product and that this donor retention wheel is measuring that information for you on a daily basis. And just to give you a little idea of what the donor retention meter does, it's sort of like the Dow Jones of your database. So you can tell exactly what's happening. When people hear the Dow Jones, they, they always want to know what the difference is with the Dow Jones from a week ago or from a several weeks ago. They have a point of reference. This shows back exactly 365 days and reflects the changes that your database is going through on a daily, weekly, and monthly basis, making that come to life. So it's very automatic, and it's no guesswork. And we tend to find what is watched is very quickly rest. People can see what changes are being made in their behavior that makes a difference in the donor behavior. So did a good job of talking about defining lifetime value before, but it's the repeat and it's the total net contribution that a donor generates 
during his or her lifetime in your database. And I loved his example of someone making their last gift at, at age 101. Because the average lifetime in a donor database for most organizations, if you uh, encompass all the new donors that come in, especially in this day and age of so much peer-to-peer -peer fundraising and event-based fundraising, and et cetera, uh, most organizations, it's below two years is the uh, the time in a database for most uh, individuals that are there for that. And the average gift is going to probably be somewhere between $100 and $200 for most databases. So you can sort of figure it out and play the math out yourself when you're looking at the divine value. So what value is so important here? Well, we're looking at the value segment. In almost every fundraising uh, site I've been in, there's been some sort of a pyramid. And what we're talking about here, most people tend to come in at the bottom two sections of the pyramid. And over time, the value moves up and as time increases. And this reflects itself in that the average gift many times moves up, especially if there's a capital campaign or some other type of endowment campaign that allows a bitch gift to come in there. But more importantly, as people move up this pyramid, two important things happen. Uh, it becomes a very strong habit of with their giving, but I think it's also very important for the reason that they are all stewards of your organization and they become wonderful prospects for begging and plan giving. Uh, it's usually these people that are right in the middle of this pyramid that have been giving over time are your very, very best chances for best giving to happen from that. It makes such a big difference for that. So I wanted to compare, uh, much like Tom did, the commercial sector to the non-for-profit sector of what customers leave. And this was taken from a retail study. And from this retail study, 1% of the customers left due to death. 3% due to relocation, 5% only were won over by competitors, 14% due to bad complaint handling, and lack of interest from us, 77%. Uh, and if that doesn't go to the point of what communications can mean and what a difference it might make there to do that. And a wonderful case in point, I often tell the story of the retail dry cleaner that's located right between where I live and where my office is at. And I have been going to this dry cleaners now for about 12 years, and I have yet to be called by my first name. And even though it's only the owner and one or two other staff members that wait on me every morning, they go in there. It's usually once a week or once every two weeks. And what's I think is probably for the last five years, every single time I've gone in there, I've handed them my debt card, and they can see my name printed on there. So... After being associated with Tom and Adrian, uh, I started an experiment. Tom, I don't think I've ever told you about this, but I started this experiment about a year and a half ago that I started calling the employees and the owner by their first name every time I went in just to see if that would change it around. And yet to this day, they have still have not called me by the name Jay when I walk in there. Now, let's take a look. And this is from Dr. Adrian Sargent's research, the key reasons for donors leaving. Reasons no longer able to afford support. But I want to think about as I unveil the rest of these, how many of the rest of these involve communications in some form or another? Uh, why donors are leaving? No memory of ever supporting. Well, my is that, that the thank you did not make much of an impression there on that individual, if that's the case. The patient asked for inappropriate thumbs. Well, they probably used some sort of a wrong formula or try to automate it in some way that was inappropriate for the results that happened there. Fear causes were more deserving. Well, obviously, they were not aware of what their means were going for and how important that work was and how important the mission was. They were not reminded to give again. And know that there is this balance of how much communications, and that's why. I'm a big, big believer in surveys and having surveys help define the role for us. The organization did not inform how the monies were used and overall did not feel connected. So when you think about that, this whole communications and acknowledgement process is just so vital because it literally takes care of most of these reasons for people leaving, particularly first-year donors. Look about what 
age and retaining donors. These are really important on turning first-time donors into repeat donors. Uh, drip feed mission performance data. Uh, particularly if you present it in such a manner of what they did to affect the mission and how your mission is being performance. The connection often, once again, I'll point back, I think it's very important for any first-time donor that you send a survey within the first 90 days and ask them their opinion on a few things, most importantly, how often and in what manner they would like to be communicated with. Be personal. If you're using any sort of database at all, it should be very easy to be able to segment that. Uh, one of the cardinal rules I use, if someone comes in and their first gift is above the average gift amount of your database, you've got to do something different and something special. Uh, you've got to be able to do that. Also, if someone's coming in as a repeat donor, let them know how special they are and let them know that they are a repeat donor. There should be a different thank you letter for the time donor versus the repeat donor versus the higher level donor versus the lower level donor. That simple segmentation into four quadrants there alone will make a big difference uh, to do that. And go back and change those thank you letters if you've got a database. I help thousands of people put databases in, and one of the saddest things I often find is I'll go back to an organization five, six, seven years later, and they're still using the same single thank you letter that read like that robotic letter that Tom was talking about earlier, is what they're sending out to every donor, new, repeat, high, low, board member, etc. It's a sort of a tax receipt letter, and they haven't changed it since the day we loaded it in there. Keep in mind that retention is built just like a good personal relationship. Uh, anybody that I meet, if we could in the future, we want to do it often and in multiple means, sometimes in person, sometimes by phone, sometimes electronically, sometimes very written. And then the next one here, find and use numerous human connectors. If someone brought an individual to your organization, this is particularly true in the peer-to-peer -peer phrasing. If someone sponsors somebody that's a participant in your event, let the thank you letter come from the participant. Uh, or let the follow-up letter come from the participant and say what, why you participated in the event and why I ask you to be a sponsor. This is such an important bit of information using those connectors. And then, as we said earlier, always communicate what the money are doing. What are my funds doing that are making a difference? And what would it mean if I was not there to support you? Those are so, so vital. So with those items in mind there, uh, we wanted to leave the last 15 minutes for some of the questions. So I'll turn it back over to our master ceremonies and see what questions they would like to fire at Tom or myself here. Well, thank you both so much for uh, all that information. Um, I I hope a lot of people were able to retain and, and uh, gain the knowledge uh, from your presentation. Um, and thank you to everyone who's already submitted a question. Uh, we have some great ones in the queue, uh, and I'd like you all to discuss them. We have a question from Joanne. Uh, what is the industry standard or range for lifetime value of there? I don't know. Uh, you, you might. <laughs> yeah, what I have seen is the Average timeline is slightly less than two years. So you've got a lot of people that are there just less than a year, and then you've got some people that are older. So it's going to be somewhere between one and two years. And gift for most organizations is going to be somewhere between $100 and $200. So you can sort of do the math there that the lifetime value on the average is going to be those two multiplied together. Uh, obviously, you've got the exceptions on both sides, but that's what the sort of the middle of the road average is going to be for most organizations. Tom, would you add to that? Well, that the the average, of course, is a reflection of what we think right now is a fairly uh, unsuccessful uh, effort by many charities in their communications work. Um, so, is it going to be if you were to look at Let's say isolate out ten best practice uh, organizations who are doing everything perfectly. Would they have those same averages? I don't think so. I think they'd have much rosier averages than that. One of the good things that you can compare 
there is pair the lifetime value of your repeat donors, guy that's been with you two years longer versus the overall average of the organizations. And you can see that out of most databases. And boy, the stark difference between those two would make anybody work very hard to make sure that every first-time donor becomes a repeat donor. Yeah. Excellent. And uh, we have another question. How do we bring lapsed donors back? Uh, just donors that have given in the past, but they not have given last year, so they're not factoring into any rates. Is there any hope in winning them back? Uh, there's great hope. Uh, some direct mail programs, I mean, I write these kinds of letters, uh, lapsed donor letters. Uh, the first thing I think we need to uh, uh, recognize is some of our own bad practices. Even using a term like lapsed it suggests that it's their fault. You know, why did they? They're not from anything. They're, they're, they've gone on with their life. You're just not part of that anymore. And I think that, you know, a genuine uh, appeal to them saying something like lines of, you know, you gave to us once and that is so important to us. Um, but we notice that you've stopped giving. I hope that isn't for any, you know, well, whatever you want to say at that point. You want to be friendly, you want to be honest, you want to be open, you want to be sincere, you want to be humble, you want to, you know, love them to death. And so many times people lapse, I think, just because of your, you know, the, you haven't done a great job of communicating with them. It's not their fault. It's that you, you know, they kind of show up in their mailboxes when you want to ask for money. So, um, and that is all over. I mean, it's very interesting. I, I um, was privileged to hear from the the, the campaign uh, guy how Brown University did their capital campaign and exceeded goal. He said, you know, when we get out on the road and we started talking to major donor prospects around the country, the number one uh, thing, complaint they heard was, we never hear from you except when you want money. And um, that, I think, is probably uh, a complaint you would hear from almost every donor base uh, in the world, because so few charities spend any quality time doing relationship building that's honest and uh, is not, you know, does not have some ulterior motive. I, think I would add to that, too. I think there's a huge difference between a lapsed donor that then a donor above your average gift amount versus a lapsed donor that's below. If someone's above your average gift amount and they're listening, I think it's maybe well worth the effort of writing a handwritten note, phone and calling them, using a human connector to reach out to them. If someone's in, particularly if they're at two or three times your average amount, not rely just on the very well-written letter and techniques that Tom's talking about, but make the extra efforts because the potential lifetime value, if you can save that person and bring him back in the fold, is thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, and it may be well worth making that personal outreach. I agree. Uh, we have another one from Karen. Uh, it's hard to quantify or show donors what their money did in an environmental organization or any organization that doesn't have uh, dramatic stories like uh, dealing with children or pets. Uh, do you have any suggestions on how those, uh, not, not, you know, the organs that don't pull on your heartstrings, how can they uh, show what their money is doing? The, 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 the stock and trade, for instance, of donor newsletters is be is the before and after story. So, you know, they, you, you a little child came in from the Sudan who was starving. And now, three months later, she's looking really healthy and bouncy, and, and she's been saved. You know, so that's the, that's, that's the child story. Now, in final groups, I have uh, a special place in my heart for them because I, I believe that it is actually the environmental movement that caused global warming. They were inept at explaining what the problem was, or you know, getting out of their own uh, their own civic, you know, mindset. That um, that the rest of us kind of you know, it crept up on us, and now here we are. The, you know, the, the, the that will be a cinder in another thousand years. So, in middle groups, their their tendency is to throw science at 
there at the donors. The donors are not scientists. And, you know, one of the great things, lessons I learned from a guy named Richard Radcliffe, a, a researcher in London, well, he said, you know, I, I've interviewed over 17,000, not a misprint, 17,000 donors personally, mostly in focus focus groups, and uh, about why they make gifts. And he said, uh, i got to tell you that they are, his words, staggeringly ignorant of the cause they support. And he said that's not, that shouldn't be interpreted as a bad thing. It should be interpreted as an opportunity. Frankly, the reason I would support an environmental cause is because it matches my values. I don't need to know in detail or statistically what, you know, Oh, the the progress we've made, like saving the you know some uh, almost think salamander or something. I, it's not you don't have to quantify. What you have to do in to retain me is love me to death and point out to me on a regular basis well, this this fight in uh, why it matters. And and with an environmental group, it is a fight all the. Time and it's a it's right now you couldn't have more attention being paid in the general uh, you know news media uh, to the consequences of, of uh, climate change global warming and so forth so um, you know when you quantify my first reaction is why do you want to do that because I'm a little bit suspicious I might add to that. That, Tom, too, in this day and age of video, one of environmental groups, and I can't remember what it was, should a time lapse of the effect on a glacier with warming, and it was, although it was less than 30 seconds, it was so powerful, and it was very simple for them to slip it into the email and use the video and make that come to life. Yeah, you know, one of the things that, um, one of the advantages is it, understanding the psychology behind what people are giving to you in the first place. I would say that with with environmental groups, one of the key things, advantages you have, emotionally speaking, is what's cost aversion, which is built into the human brain. Loss aversion, to give you my layman's misinterpretation of it, and I'm sure I'm screwing it up, but the, um, as I understand it, loss aversion is there's something you appreciate, like, want, admire, need, what, and I say, well, but you know that go away. You know, um, your tendency, your, your internal mental tendency, is to say, no, 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 isn't there something we can do to prevent that from going away? I don't want that to go away, and that's where you know your group steps in as an environmental group and says, we are the, we are going to. To make sure everything we can possibly do is done, but we can't do that without your help. So, you know, there you go. Excellent. Um, now, there was some confusion about the donor retention uh, calculation that you made, Jay, uh, from Amanda and a few others. Uh, does okay. the calculation of donor retention, does that account for donor acquisition as well? And couldn't retention appear higher if new donors are factored into the current year? Well, if they could, uh, if you if you brought the new donors in, but they are not actually retained until they give the second time. They're still just new donors, so the retention rate is uh, only looking at whether people make a second gift transaction, and usually over a specified time period uh, for that. So if you count a brand new donor. Uh, that's really not a retained donor. So it, you, you're counting in your overall revenue, but bear in mind when we're talking about retention, we're actually seeing if someone cares enough about your organization to drop that checkbook or that credit card a second time, and they're retained. And, and, and remember, once they've done it a second time in a magical stratosphere, the ability to retain them from that point on goes from 20 or 30 percent up to 70 percent or higher and that is a huge huge difference in your overall success of the organization for that in fact that's why the the common discussion how much time do we let our staff spend on acquiring new donors versus focusing care and love on existing donors which one is going to uh, raise the most money for us and affect our mission the most over the course of a decade 
question for Tom. Uh, you, spoke, uh, you spoke out against donor lists, and uh, a couple of our listeners would like to know what you suggest uh, for organizations to do uh, other than listing donors in websites or programs, et cetera, uh, just to make sure that no donor feels slighted that they don't see their name in any yeah. location. Yeah, um, let me clarify in case uh, I made the wrong impression with you. I'm not saying don't do donor lists uh, because they are a convention and people expect it and therefore you should do it. What I'm saying is that uh, that if that is the extent of your uh, donor recognition program, then you've got 1% of what you need to have in place. It's it's not it's necessary and not enough. Um, you need the which is basically donor love, and you need that love to be expressed through your asks, your thanks, and your reporting mechanisms. Excellent. Uh, we only have time for another question. Uh, we really want to respect everyone's time and keep this webinar at an hour. So for the last one, I know our sector is very torn on this. Uh, donor gifts. Uh, do you recommend sending thank you gifts to large donors uh, or to any donors, uh, T-shirts, mugs, etc., or does that detract from the efforts of an organization? you want to kill it or you want me to kill it, Jay? I'll let you kill it first, Todd. I'll add something to it. <laughs> Because we all know what how hard premium donors are to stick to keep. So yeah, premium. Uh, what you're talking about are premiums, you know. So uh, they're and they're they come in all, you know, there's varieties, front end premiums, back end premiums, blah blah. Uh, tote bags. Let's 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 take it to the tote, tote bags. And um, what uh, what we are trying to prove actually right now. You know, Adrian Sargent and I and Jen Shang and uh, some people. People are working with public television across the country and trying to prove that you can make just as much money with premiums, i.e. DVDs of Dalton Abbey, as you can with, with them. And uh, it's going to be an interesting um, it's going to be an interesting experiment. So far, it looks like it's working, but we have a lot more research to do. The truth is you can always bring in uh, more people if you give them stuff. That, uh, for one thing, that locks into a t another uh, factor in human psychology called reciprocity. So, in reciprocity, basically, you you know, you send me something uh, like uh, yet more unnecessary, unneeded, self-sticking address labels, um, and even though I don't want them, I didn't ask for them. I have no use for them because I've still I've got a drawer full of them. I still consider, because of psychological reciprocity, you a token gift, so $10, $15, $20. Um, and it looks like this is successful. And I you know, I know uh, down in Australia, Sean Triner's group, Pareto, has done a lot of work with, with premiums. They swear by them. They think they can uh, make it all work. And I, I you know, it's just another, t it's another tactic. I'm not sure... Uh, it's a, a great long-term tactic, but frankly, if you're only holding on to people for a couple of years, you know, <laughs> what, what does it matter? Um, the only thing I would add to that, Tom, um, is that what amount of money that you would be putting into the thank you gifts and stuff, consider using some of those dollars for maybe additional staff that could make a thank you much more of a powerful full statement, maybe handwritten notes, maybe uh, actual thank you phone calls, things that will make a very lasting impression on the donor and separate you from the crowd. Yep. That's excellent. Um, that is a very hot topic uh, within the nonprofit sector, and it's great to get you uh, get your opinions on that. Uh, many thanks to Tom Ahern and Jay Love for joining us and providing such amazing insight and information on donor retention. And thank you to all of our participants for being so engaged in sending in such great questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them, but uh, we'll continue the conversation uh, in our follow-up email. And also, uh, I'd like to invite you all to reach out to uh, Jay and Tom uh, via social media. Uh, Jay is at, a, at Jay Bark Love. Uh Tom, do you have a Twitter, or do you have somewhere that you'd like people to reach out to you? Yeah, I do have 
have a Twitter. My Twitter handle is that Tom Ahern, all one word, no spaces. Excellent. Um, we will have a link. Yes. All right, so Harry. Uh, also, people, if they if they just go to the bloomerang.co website too, there's a lot of additional information there if anybody so desires that too. Okay, excellent. Thank you for that. Um, we'll have a link to the slides of this presentation on nonprofit911.org by tomorrow, and you'll also get a copy in your inbox shortly, um, along with the recording for the presentation and uh, some information on Tom and Jay. Uh, please join us for our next webinar uh, next Tuesday. It's Bill Generosity Network to Nonprofit. That's October 1st at 1 p.m. Eastern. Uh, and we'll be joined by philanthropists, uh, current authors, Jeff Walker and Jennifer McCray. You can register for that webinar and find out about future opportunities at nonprofit911.org. And with that, I'd like to conclude today's session. Please remain with us a few moments longer to provide us with some valued feedback via our webinar survey. And thanks again for joining us. And thank you, everyone, for unleashing generosity. Bye-bye.